So we will be using one of the most familiar techniques that is one of mathematical induction, <laughs> right? So let dimension of V is equal to one. So assertion is obviously true. I mean, forget about dimension of V, any one dimensional vector space, you'll always be able to do this. So that is a base, base case, right? So we suppose, okay, suppose the claim is true for all finite dimensional vector spaces with dimension less than dimension v which is equal to n. And what do we know? So we know that n is equal to summation m v i, i going from 1 through k plus k. So suppose this is true for all finite dimensional vector spaces with dimension less than v which is n. So for dimension 1, dimension 2, dimension 3 until dimension n minus 1, we will always be able to find this. We have already seen this to be true for 1, that is trivial. So let this be true for all numbers from 1 through n minus 1. Now we are going to make a very special choice <coughs> of a vector space whose dimension fits this criteria. So consider the image of n. What can you say about the dimension of the image of n? n is nil potent, remember? Sorry? No, is it, is it, does it fit in this criteria? Is it, does it have a dimension strictly less than n? Sorry? Right. I mean, if n was indeed non-singular, which is the only situation when n can span, that image of n can span the entire vector space. If n was non-singular, then can it be nilpotent? Any non-singular matrix cannot be nilpotent, right? Because a nilpotent matrix must have all its eigenvalues equal to 0. So there must be at least one eigenvector. Algebraic multiplicity has a lower bound of 1 cannot be less than 1. We have seen the existence of eigenvalue and eigenvector. So there must be at least one eigenvector corresponding to the 0 eigenvalue. And that means along that direction, yeah, if you take n and hit it with this, if you keep raising n to sufficient powers, it goes to 0. So what can we say about this? The dimension of the kernel is at least 1. If the dimension of the kernel is at least 1, the dimension of v and the dimension of the image of n, which is the rank of n, cannot be equal, yeah? So dimension of image n is less than, strictly less than n, clearly. Again, convince yourself that it is clear to you. I have just argued why it is clear. Because it is little potent, right? So it has one eigenvector. So it has one vector in its kernel. That eigenvector is the kernel, is a vector in the living in the kernel. Hmm? So what I'm saying is that I need to pick out an eigen a, a dimension, a vector space which has a dimension strictly less than n, and then I can invoke this Jordan canonical form. Because so that's by my assumption, right? So I'm claiming that the image of n is exactly one such vector space. Now, what can the dimension of the image of n be maximum? V, the dimension of V, which is n. But can the dimension of the image of n be n? Small n, that is. If it were, then it would be a non-singular matrix. So then there would be nothing in its kernel other than the 0. But this has all its eigenvalues equal to 0. Yeah? So therefore, the geometric multiplicity of any eigenvalue uh, must be at least 1. So at least along one direction, it pulverizes everything. So the kernel is non-trivial. If the kernel is non-trivial, the rank cannot be full rank. If the rank cannot be full rank, then the image cannot span the entire vector space V. So the dimension of the image must be, which is nothing but the rank, by diagonality theorem. 
So the dimension of the image must be less than n. So definitely at least for image n, I can assume that Jordan canonical form holds, which means that therefore by our premise there exist u1, u2, u k hat. I don't know this number k hat yet. It's not k. Poss possibly, right? Such that n raised to the m u1, u1, n raised to the m u2, sorry, u1 minus 1, u1 until u1 comma n raised to the m u2 u2 until u2 so on till n raised to the m u k hat till sorry u k hat until u k hat is a basis for what? Which vector space? The image of n. Even if V does not have a Jordan form representation or a Jordan basis, at least image of n must have a Jordan basis by our induction assumption. Because the image of n is of a dimension less than V. And we have assumed by our inductive hypothesis that for every vector space of size less than n, it admits a Jordan basis. So the image of n admits the Jordan basis and the Jordan basis would look something like this. Agreed? But it also says something more. And the following, that is n raised to the m u1 u1, n raised to the m u2 u2 until n raised to the m u k hat u k hat is a basis for what exactly? Exactly. It is a basis for the kernel of n restricted to the image of n, which is nothing but a fancy way of writing what? It is the image intersection the kernel or image of n intersection kernel of n. So that part of the kernel dwelling inside the image, that is what this means. The restriction of the kernel of n to the image of n. You cannot consider the entire kernel. No, the entire kernel resides inside V. But we are only admitting, we are only focusing our attention on a smaller vector space a strictly smaller vector space, a strictly smaller subspace of V which is image of n. So we cannot have the entire kernel, we cannot assume that the entire kernel lives inside this. So only some part of the kernel which intersects with image of n, that is the restriction of the kernel of n to the image of n, whose basis is given by this. Is this clear? Please take your time to absorb this. This is obvious. This is just applying this inductive hypothesis on a vector space whose dimension is less than that of V. That is what we do in induction. We take, we see something is true for 1, then we take something to be true for a number smaller than a certain number and then we say that if it is true for that number also, the bigger number, then we say by induction we can extend this. Right? Now, what can you say about u1, u2 until u k hat. Where do they come from? They are obviously part of the image of n. So can we not say That is, 
for every one of those fellows u1 through uk hat, there must exist a pre-image v1 through vk hat such that when n acts on these fellows, it equals ui. That's what it means that for something to be in the image of n. It means that it must dwell in the column span of n in the matrix notation, right? Very important observation next. What do you think is the relation between MVI and MUI? What is the relation exactly? If you hit VI a certain number of times with N, it will definitely pulverize it because it's nilpotent, so it's in the annihilating ideal of VI. Yeah? MVI minus 1, does everybody agree that N, MUI is equal to MVI minus 1? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We have already pulled one out because they belong to the image. So we have, if you hit this MVI times, then you need to hit this MVI minus 1 times. Is it not? But MUI is exactly the number of times you need to hit UI until it vanishes. So the number of times you need to hit ui is one less than the number of times you need to hit vi because ui is obtained by hitting vi already once with n. So the number of times ui needs to be hit before it gets pulverized is one short of the number of times vi needs to be hit. So this is true. Nothing fancy, right? Just bookkeeping. Right? Next non-trivial step, I mean so far, so far are any of these steps very, I mean except for a bit of a notation and maybe bookkeeping, none of these steps we have we used any, anything very fancy so far, right? Just a bit of a rank nullity and just keeping count of the indices and so on. Yeah, I do tend to mess them up a bit sometimes, but I hope this is clear so far, right? So the next important point, <coughs> The next important point is we already have a basis for the kernel of n restricted to the image of n. Can we not extend that basis to get a basis for the entire kernel of n? Right? So, basis for kernel of n intersection image of n we already have, which is n, sorry, to the m u1, u1 until n to the m uk hat, uk hat, okay? So consider and extend it to a basis for kernel n by augmenting with what number? What do we know as the basis for the kernel of n? What is the number for the kernel of n? Yeah, by our premise here, this is just k, no? So out of the k, we already have k hat fellows here. So we will need to add K, hat, K minus K hat fellows, yeah? So let's say those are V K hat plus 1, V K hat plus 2 until V K. So that the union of this set and this set, yeah? So you see that the span of this and the span, and the span of this, that is this vector space, their direct sum will be the vector space V, right? This is a complementary, the, the span of this is the complementary subspace to this, right? So their direct sum is, nothing can dwell simultaneously in this. This we've already seen, basic, very basic results. If you have a vector space and you are extending it 
to a bigger vector space by adding some more fellows in the basis, then the span of those additional fellows creates a complementary subspace. We have seen this just a few lectures back, right? And nothing can dwell simultaneously in this complementary subspace and the vector space itself. So they are going to be a direct sum, right? So anyway, that is besides the point, but you can always do that. So now the big claim, claim V1, V2, V k hat, V k hat plus 1, V k is the set we need. What do I mean by saying that the set we need? It means this is exactly the set which will allow me to generate this entire Jordan basis, this Jordan chain. What is the implication? So if you have copied this down, I will just erase it, okay? So let me also place this here, m v i minus 1 is equal to m u i. So this claim essentially boils down to claiming that if I just take these and keep hitting them with n, keep hitting v1 with n, how many times? m v1, keep hitting v2 with n, m v2 times until I go like this, then I will exactly have the entire Jordan basis, the Jordan chain that will allow me to get to the Jordan canonical form. So what we need to show is, to show that, that particular set is linearly independent. Because if I am able to show that, then I will be done. Just look at the numbers. This has k, just like I need here, k. And I am going to be just generating mv1 extra from here, mv2 extra from here, mv3 extra from here. So k plus summation mvi. So if I am able to now show that summation alpha 1 j, j running from 1 through mv1, n to the j, sorry, j running from 0, n to the j. So obviously n to the 0 is just identity, yeah. So n to the j v1 plus summation j is equal to 0 to m v2, n to the j v2 plus dot 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 plus summation j is equal to 0 to m v k hat. Sorry, yeah, you need alphas, correct. Alpha 2 j, this is alpha k hat j n to the j v k hat plus alpha k hat plus 1 0 v k hat plus 1 plus dot 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 till alpha k 0 v k is equal to 0 for all alpha i j is equal to 0. This is what I, have, what I have to show because I have the adequate numbers to span the entire n dimensional vector space because this is n. I have sufficient number of vectors already. If I am now able to show that this is linearly independent, I am done. This is the Jordan basis, right? I have already assured myself that I have sufficient numbers to constitute a basis. So it is a, the dimension matches provided it is linearly independent. That is guaranteed to be a spanning set as well, right? So let us call this a double star. I will not erase that equation. I will probably erase other things. So hit this double star with n on both sides. 
what happens? What happens to these fellows when you hit them with n? These were after all sitting inside the kernel of n. So these fellows immediately vanish. The moment you hit this equation with n on both sides, these additional fellows already vanish. Yeah? Sorry? Not all of them. The first ones of first entries of each of these sums vanishes. So what happens? So multiplying with n, what do we get? So the sum will start from summation j is equal to 0 through m v1 alpha 1 j n to the j plus 1 v1 but see it will not go up to mv1 right because mv1 plus 1 will already vanish. So this sum I need to only consider till this plus summation j is equal to 0 to m v2 minus 1 alpha 2 j n to the j plus 1 v2 plus dot 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 till summation j is equal to 0 to m v k hat minus 1 alpha k hat j n to the j plus 1 v k hat is equal to 0. Is that clear? What has happened? All of these fellows have gone off, they have been knocked off because they were already straight away fellows sitting inside the kernel. So this part has already vanished upon hitting it with uh, n. And each of the first terms of these, they happen to be also fellows into the kernel. So the first term has vanished, but the first term has vanished means I've just made this adjustment. We just added one n. And now I do not need to go up to mv1 because n to the mv1 plus 1 acting on v1 is anyway going to vanish. But this, so the green one works, right? This is what mu1, right? So I am going to make two changes now. j is equal to 0 and this is mu1. Just look at this. For i is equal to 1 through k hat, this is the relation we have just argued a while back. This is alpha 1, sorry, alpha 1 j. This is n to the j. What is n v1? n v1 is u1 because u1 is that exact fellow which I obtained upon acting n on v1. So this is u1 plus summation j is equal to 0 to m u2 alpha 2 j n to the j u2 plus dot 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 plus j going from 0 through m u k hat alpha k hat j n to the j u k hat is equal to 0. What does this tell you? What do I know about these fellows? They are linearly independent because they form a basis for image of n, yeah? But these vectors form basis for image n and are thus linearly independent. If they are linearly independent, then all of these coefficients must vanish. So if I use this relation now in this, what are the only terms remaining? Only the first fellows in this original equation, those coefficients are non-zero perhaps and these coefficients are perhaps non-zero. But what do those terms constitute? They are also a linearly independent set because they exactly span by my whole construction the kernel of n. They are the basis for the kernel of n. So in other words, every one of these coefficients have to be zero like I argued. So let me just complete that, it will take me a couple of minutes. So this color works I suppose, right? Okay, great. So now, where do I, okay. Okay, so plugging this in double star, 
we get n raised to the, the last fellow, oops, n raised to the m v1 v1 or rather alpha 1 m v1 plus alpha 2 m v2 n raised to the m v2 v2 plus dot 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 till alpha k hat m v k hat v k hat plus alpha k hat plus 1 0 v k hat plus 1 plus dot 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 till alpha k 0 v k is equal to 0. Just as I said, these are the only terms that survive. So, if these are the only terms that survive, but this is also but this is a linear combination of basis vectors for kernel n. Hence, alpha i j is equal to 0 for all i j as required. Right. So, there you have it, the proof of the Jordan canonical form. Okay. So, first we start with this step, then we hit it with n. We have done all the groundwork before this. Once you have written this down like this, the numbers are already there in its favor. All that you need to show is linear independence. So, you hit it with n on both sides. Many of those terms go off, but precisely the terms in the kernel go off. But the remaining terms, because they come from or they somehow constitute the image, when they are acted on once by n, they actually lead to terms in the image, not just any arbitrary term in the image of n, but also the basis elements in the image of n. So, they are a linearly independent set and their linear combination going to 0 means each of those coefficients must be 0. It is a trivial linear combination. So, then plug that back in again here okay? and the terms that survive after that are exactly the basis elements in the kernel. So, they must also be 0. right? So, just hitting it with n once you arrive at this conclusion. Okay. So, this is the beauty of the Jordan canonical form. We hope we have elucidated uh, substantially what the benefits of getting a Jordan canonical form are prior to the proof. So, I would like to keep the proof as the last point because sometimes it helps in proving certain things. Similar techniques also help, yeah, particularly when you are dealing with nilpotent matrices and when you get a linearly independent set upon acting repeatedly with the nilpotent matrix. Those results are very interesting. If I keep hitting something repeatedly with a matrix until it becomes a 0 at one point and at no preceding stage has it been 0, then there are certain guarantees of that operator being nilpotent. Okay? Perhaps you can think of those beautiful little properties. You have to think about the annihilating ideals and stuff a bit. Okay? Those are some hints. Think about those. There are adequate problems in your problem sheet. Do work them well okay? and best of luck for your exams. We will try to keep it in a slot that is uh, suited to everybody. Thank you.